our brains are under fire and they've been under fire for a number of years now and that's why we're seeing rising rates of cognitive dysfunction, rising rates of strokes and rising rates of, of vascular disease and dementia. Greens are one of the most accessible, cheap and effective means of trying to improve our overall health, particularly with brain health. Just give us a quick rundown. Who are you and tell us a little bit about your story. How did you come to this place where we have a doctor that's writing cookbooks and yeah. teaching people about how food is medicine. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird how I was thinking about a conventionally trained doctor talking about food and medicine. And my story kind of started about 10 years ago. Um, so 2009, when I just qualified as a junior doctor in the UK. And stressful life, you know, doing night shifts, working, first time on clinical environment. I developed something called perigosmal atrial fibrillation, which is where your heart beats exceptionally fast, in my case, irregularly. Long story short, I went through the whole sort of um, conventional sort of medicine uh, um, journey of going through different studies, investigations. I was going to have an ablation, which is where you burn an area in the heart to stop the heart essentially misfiring in this way. And it was my mum uh, who actually said to me, you know, you need to look at your nutrition and your lifestyle and try and figure this out. Go back to basics. And by overhauling my diet, my lifestyle, I was able to overcome this condition that was plaguing me two to three times a week. I was going to atrial fibrillation, going up to 200 beats per minute, lasting anywhere between 12 and 36 hours. And this sort of realization that something to do with my nutrition and my lifestyle was having an impact on this condition was sort of my, my start into the journey of like why food can be medicinal and why lifestyle is a very important feature of medicine that I wasn't taught about when I was at medical school. And then I just started having more open, honest conversations with my patients about food. I started doing a deep dive into the literature, into uh, what is the basis behind the research behind my ingredients and why food can be medicinal. Um, and then I started the Doctor's Kitchen as a little passion project, really, to just try and teach people how to eat their way to health. And, and now it's First kind on of social progressed. media, right? Yeah, really social, like media. social media, Instagram account. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was was quite cavalier back in the day. It was about four or five years ago now. Talking about food and medicine back then was kind of like, well, you know, what is this quack talking about? Especially in the UK, which tends to be a little bit more conservative than we are here in the US. Absolutely, yeah. We're very much, we're much more conservative. We're much more skeptical about it. And that's why for me, bringing the evidence base behind why food has such a big impact on, on health and wellness is very important. Um, and, you know, I think it's good to encourage a healthy dose of skepticism because it encourages us as scientists to be a lot more proactive, to be a lot more uh, reasoned and well-informed. And actually, you know, that's, that's actually served me quite well. So that's why in both the books, the back pages are indexed with all the references, like 200 odd re references every book I, I put out there. And I'm currently studying my, uh, for my master's in nutritional medicine at the University of Surrey as well, just to add to that level of sort of uh, rigor that I bring to anything that I put out there. Yeah, and you talk about the skepticism. It's good for the skepticism to go both ways because there's so many things that you were taught in medical school that maybe was just accepted as, as, as fact, but it may not be the complete story when it came to uh, a condition. You know, you mentioned your history with heart health. In the book, you have a whole section on heart health. Yeah. And especially for a lot of your following that's probably a little bit younger, who's maybe not focused on heart disease right now, uh, you wrote at the opening of the chapter, you say, if you're tempted to skip over this chapter because you're in your mid-20s or early 30s and you believe that a heart disease is something only a concern for later on in life, think carefully about flicking past these pages. Heart disease isn't something that we suddenly... Uh, Heart disease isn't something that suddenly becomes relevant as soon as we reach a certain age or threshold. We build the foundations for a healthy or unhealthy heart in our childhood, and we are starting to see the early signs of atherosclerosis in those as young as teenagers. So when you look at your condition and the AFib that you were dealing with, the regular heartbeat, where did you start to learn the link between lifestyle and how that possibly could be contributing to the root factors that could increase AFib. Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually something that really started my journey from, from, from the get-go because no one at my age with no past medical history, with no family history, with no weight issues, otherwise generally healthy, has been generally healthy the whole life, is meant to have atrial fibrillation, right? 
um, it, the, you know, there's a misfiring issue, the, it, it could have been a re-entry pathway, all these things were ruled out by all the different investigations I had. So really my journey over the last 10 years has been trying to retros retrospectively figure out why I had it in the first place and why nutritional lifestyle actually helped. And there's so many different theories, right? It could have been improving my microbiota. So improving the number and the variety of different foods that I introduced into my diet that helped flourish and nurture this, this population of microbes that's absolutely inseparable from health, reducing inflammation, improving neurotransmitters, uh, improving short chain fatty acid synthesis. Uh, it could have been me introducing, again, different sorts of uh, plant fibers, uh, sorry, um, uh, plants uh, in totality and different sorts of ingredients that may have uh, uh, improved my micronutrient content in the food. So essentially, improving the levels of vitamin E or magnesium or zinc in my diet that would have been lacking and perhaps not picked up by conventional testing. It could have been uh, my stress levels, right? So uh, at the time I was working night shifts uh, and I still do night shifts and I still do like a lot of like long hours working in the NHS, but it could have been my uh, reaction to that and my, um, my intolerance for the stresses of working in a hospital environment that could have been leading to atrial fibrillation. There's so many different factors that I simultaneously uh, helped through looking at the body rather than as an individual silo, looking at just the heart, looking at the totality of the body. So improving my internal environment actually led to improvement of the symptoms. Yeah, and we're here at the annual Functional Medicine Conference in San Antonio. And a big part of the work of functional medicine and practitioners out there like Dr. Hyman and other researchers in this space is really, let's not think of the body as individual little silos that everything impacts everything, which is both beautiful and also makes it a little bit difficult to do studies on did this improve your AFib? Well, it's the totality of it all. Is it the reduction in inflammation that happened from getting better sleep? or the increase in the microbiome, as you discussed, which also helps regulate inflammation inside the body. There's so many factors that play a role, but I think what's great is that when somebody reads your book and the work that you put out there on social media, it's kind of the recognition of like, all these things matter and we have evidence. Yes, we may not have evidence that this one diet is right for this cancer, but when you look at the overwhelming data that's out there, we unequivocally know that these things are gonna have positive benefits for us. Absolutely, and you know, the whole purpose of the second book, I didn't wanna write a second book actually, it was my publisher was like, you should definitely write a second book. I was like, I don't wanna, I, I think the first book was standalone enough, like introducing people to the beauty of uh, the, uh, the foods as well as combining that with nutritional science, that's exactly what the first book in, encompassed. But the, the idea for the second book came about is because I wanted to, people to understand that when you zoom into different conditions, so you look at brain health, you look at inflammation imbalance, or you look at immunity, um, there's so many different foods that we can use and the in individual sort of uh, scientific literature looking at that one um, uh, aspect of medicine. When you zoom out, like I did in the final chapter, you realize it's all the same. You wanna look after your microbes. You wanna look after inflammation balance. You wanna introduce a lot more different variety of foods, particularly from plants. You wanna have quality fats. You wanna eat in time. And when you do all those things, you're not just looking after your brain in isolation. You're looking after your brain, immune health, skin health, eye health, et cetera. And because that's why- everything affects everything. Everything accepts it. Everything affects everything. And by zooming into different chapters and then zooming out at the end, I'm encouraging the reader to understand the interconnectedness of our body essentially. And as a general practitioner, someone who's trained in, in family practice, you guys call it over here in the US, it's easy for me to see that because I see people from all different walks of life coming in with different conditions, whether it be mental health related, whether it be brain health related, cognition related, and I notice the patterns in between them. I notice that actually a lot of these things can be helped by applying the principles of healthy eating and lifestyle. It seems uh, just so straightforward, but of course there's, there's <laughs> always pushback anytime yeah, you start talking always. about any of this, which we'll get to uh, later on. So let's zoom in for a second. You know, this is the Broken Brain Podcast. We do zoom in on brain health a little bit, but of course we talk about all aspects because it all affects the brain. So help us understand, actually, if I, I would love to pass you your own book. Yeah, If you yeah, could just sure. read this opening section. Yeah, sure, And I wanna sure. zoom into, um, 
I want to zoom into brain health for a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I love these chapter openers because it kind of gives everyone like, you know, a little introduction as to why you should be skipping the chapter. Yeah. And actually the one on heart health was really funny because a friend of mine read it and he was like, I was hooked on that chapter like because he's 30, he's got cholesterol imbalance and a whole bunch of other things. With the brain one, to kick off the eating to be illness discussion, there is simply nowhere more fascinating to start than with the brain. Our most prized possession, it controls the centers for movement, thought, emotion, and all the automatic processes, such as breathing and heart rate, that we don't have to consciously concern ourselves with. And quite literally, it is the most advanced machine ever known to us. And unlike the latest computer gadget, we all have one. We need to start looking after it. Beautiful. When you were thinking about organizing the book, how did you end up uh, deciding to put the section on brain first? So I decided to put the brain one first because I think it's probably underrepresented when we talk about food. Um, most people think about weight. Most people think about um, fat imbalance or cardiovascular health. But actually, the Heat to Be Illness sort of book was designed to get people to start thinking about food as important to every single medical specialty, whether it be ophthalmology, whether it be brain health, whether it be skin health. Um, because when we start looking at food as an important intervention for medicine, we start appreciating a lot more beyond just fuel. I think, particularly in the UK, we still think about food in terms of calories, energy density, macronutrient profile, or even micronutrient profile as well. So looking at, oh, I need to get my RDI for uh, zinc or uh, vitamin E. But actually, it's so much more than that. And we can't reduce the beauty of food and the quality of food down to single micronutrients. It's got to be about the totality of the food because the complex arrangements of how zinc is attached to all the different micronutrients that we find in food, as well as the plant fibers, you can't replace it with supplements alone. I, I agree. I think, you know, with supplementation, there definitely has a role, but it's got to be a food first approach. Absolutely. Because we don't understand how all those nutrients work in collaboration with each other. Exactly. Right? And there aren't RCTs, there aren't any sort of scientific uh, methods to demonstrate whether a food is doing a job because of phytonutrients, so the plant chemicals we find in, food, in, in plant foods, or whether it's because of the zinc content or whether it's because of the copper. And that's why when you see studies that are based on the inclusions of certain foods in the diet, so the Mediterranean diet, for example, and then a scientist or some researchers kind of figure out like, you know what, it might be the vitamin C content or the vitamin E content. So why don't we create an RCT, a randomized controlled trial, where we give controls a placebo and then another uh, uh, cohort um, some vitamin E or something like that, and a high dose or the equivalent dose that you find in food, or maybe two times what you find in food. And the results are, they're staggeringly um, inefficient. They, 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 they don't demonstrate an impact. And in a lot of cases, they sometimes demonstrate harm as well. And that goes back to me thinking about food as the totality of the ingredients that we find in food. Because it's not, you can't simplify it to one single um, micronutrient or one single component of food. It's got to be the complex mechanism of food. It's got to be the complex, uh, uh, the, the wholeness of food itself. So before we talk about the brain and what foods are beneficial for the brain and obviously for the whole body, but you've highlighted a few for the brain, what do we need to understand about the brain to understand why food is important for the brain and what foods are important? Like what are some ground rules or education you want to share with our audience about the brain? Absolutely. So your brain is really the powerhouse and the, the housing of the trillions of neural synapses, the different connections you have with the wiring of, of um, your neurons. Um, that essentially is the, the mechanism by which we, we produce emotions the mechanism by which we, we have our movement, the fact that I'm coordinating my hands right now is all because of the brain. And we only really appreciate the, the beauty of our brains when something goes wrong, when we have something like a stroke, or maybe we have brain fog, or maybe we have inexplicable fatigue, which I see a lot these days. And I think our brains are under fire, and they've been under fire for a number of years now. And that's why we're seeing rising rates of cognitive dysfunction, rising rates of strokes, and rising rates of, of vascular disease and dementia, and neurodegenerative problems. And I'm not saying it can all be explained by food, but food is a huge, huge component. When you look at our Western lifestyles, and you look at the associations between what we're putting into our bodies and what's actually being shown to us. So my sort of um, 
the starting of the book is really to get people to understand just how beautiful our brains are and how we need to look after it because it is a lifelong process looking after all our different organs. The science is complex, but the solutions are, are simple. One of the, the I, I, for each of the, each of the chapters, I could have essentially written a whole book on it. And we could have like talked about gut health, we could have talked about mitochondrial support, we could have talked about inflammation balance for any of the chapters. So that's why I tried to zoom in on like key things from each chapter. So for the brain, we talk about neuroplasticity, which I'm sure your audience know a lot about by listening to some of your podcasts in the, in the, the previous episodes. We talk about brain inflammation, and we talk about particular diets that have been shown to improve all of those different things, reduce inflammation, improve uh, plasticity. And that's something out of the Mediterranean diet, but there's also something called the MIND diet as well, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And it's essentially a Mediterranean diet that's been adapted to increase the amount of greens, and increase the amount of colorful foods, particularly from berries. And by taking people on that journey and, and just you know, getting people to understand about inflammation balance and neuroplasticity and what those things are, you sort of coax people to think about food in a different way. It's not just for my weight, it's not just for fat loss, it's actually for my brain health as well. Yeah, and even if you don't have a stroke or even if you don't feel like there's any family history of Alzheimer's, there's ways that people suffer with their brain on a daily basis. You mentioned one, which is just this fatigue, yeah. which is full body fatigue, but also this sort of mental fatigue that's there. Brain fog is a big, is a big one. Even young children, who have very poor diets. Every parent knows that your kid gets overloaded on sugar, how that affects their brain and uh, their tolerance for being content and, and agreeable and, uh, and, and patient and everything like that. Um, so let's talk about some of the foods that play a role in being positive. So uh, in, in setting up a positive brain health. So you mentioned one, greens. What do we know about greens? So greens are one of the most accessible, cheap, and effective means of trying to improve our overall health, particularly for brain health. So when I say greens, I'm talking about everything from the brassica family, so rocket, uh, broccoli, which cabbage, we call arugula. Arugula over here, yeah, arugula. Um, uh, I'm talking about savoy cabbage. I'm talking about all the different sort of varieties of food. And actually there's a picture of like a, a, a green head yeah, uh, if you're looking at like the YouTube brain. version of the podcast, I'm holding it up over here. Yeah. You can uh, see the photo. And I love that the double the double pages of like foods to think about from the perspective of brain health. Um, so we have different greens. And what those contain are a whole milia of different phytonutrients. So we have indoor 3 carbonyl We have sulfurophane. We have um, the different sorts of, of, of micronutrients that we find in, in, in greens, particularly magnesium, which is lacking and a huge uh, proportion of both UK residents and USA residents as well, massively lacking. Magnesium, uh, I, I used to say that magnesium played a role in over 300 different functions inside the body. And we had Sean Stevenson from the Model Health Show on the podcast. He said, actually, now the latest research shows 325. I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure it's even going to be more than that, you yeah. know, because like magnesium, it's so important when you're looking at it from a very sort of simplified way. But I think, you know, it has a lot more uh, benefits and we, we're probably even realizing right now. Um, and when you when you eat greens, particularly, I'm, I'm a big fan of having greens in the morning. Like uh, I, some of the recipes are one pound recipes where I introduce people to the concept of eating broccoli for breakfast. When you say one pound, just because our audience is mostly US, you mean one doubt, like one, uh, no, one pan, sorry. One oh, pan. one pan. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I have it, a one pan section in the, in, the, in the breakfast section where it's just a skillet or saucepan. Quick and simple, straightforward breakfast. Definitely, yeah. You just put things in the pan at different uh, um, times, put the lid on, uh, let it cook, take it off, take it off the pan. I sometimes eat it out of the pan straight away if I'm in the rush in the morning. But um, that way, you know, you're, you're having a full meal rather than just cereal and milk or toast, which are just high refined carbohydrates. You're going to be eating again in the next couple of hours. It's going to spike gonna your blood sugar. Blood sugar, and you're going to have that insulin low. It's I want people to think about breakfast in a different way. Breakfast is for your brain health. Breakfast is an opportunity to increase the number of different ingredients you can get into your daily diet. And it's a, a great place to start, I think, with greens. Is there an example of a recipe here that's a, a, a one pan a yeah, recipe yeah. that you really uh, 
Absolutely, that you yeah. refer people back to when it comes to like brain health? Yeah, yeah. There's the um, the Cajun scramble, uh, and then there's the uh, one pan Greek breakfast as well. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And so you talked about greens. What are some other things that are on this pan that also play back into brain health? Yeah. So um, it's quality fats. Um, so one of the things that I think a lot of people are aware of are things like walnuts. Um, and, and different sorts of nuts and seeds because of the omega-3 content. We want to get omega-3s ideally from preformed long-chain fatty acids. So there's EPA and DHA, which I'm sure you've discussed before on, on, on the podcast, um, which are the long-chain versions of omega-3, which are a lot more accessible. A lot of people, particularly from Caucasian backgrounds, can't convert short-chain to long-chain. So you want to try and find the preformed ones in things like fatty fish, from salmon, ideally wild caught salmon, um, sardines, anchovies, the oily types of fish. Or if you're vegan, you can get them now from algae sources. There are uh, silos where you can actually buy them. They're very um, sort of clean, uh, uh, short chain fatty acids that you can find, long chain fatty acids. Um, and they have good levels of EPA and DHA now. Um, you want to try and find them in your food as well. But having walnuts and different sorts of nuts and seeds, they produce more than just the sum of uh, its fatty acid content. We're getting protein from that. You're getting fiber from that. That's going to impact your brain in so many different ways. So again, it's going back to this sort of way of di- uh, this perspective of looking at food as not just, oh, I'm eating walnuts because of the omega-3 content or I'm eating it just because of the, the fat content. I'm eating it because it's one of nature's perfect foods. It's got everything there. It's going to look after my brain as well as my heart, my skin, and all the other uh, For stuff years growing up, I would have breakfast would be a cereal or, or then bagels, Yeah. right? Bread, maybe a little bit of eggs and, and, and some bread. And then I experimented with the vegan diet for a while. But even then still, I was still doing a lot of like vegan cereals, yeah. uh, even like oatmeal. And there was a shift that happened as I started to get deeper into wellness and discover the world of like functional medicine, lifestyle medicine that was out there is my breakfast went from sweet to savory. And I started making a pan with like eggs, greens, and then sometimes even opening up a can of sardines and just adding that in there. Yeah. Or smoked salmon. Yeah. A healthy dose of olive oil on top. Yeah. And the energy that I have and the mental clarity that I have of starting the day is just completely different than starting the day off with these sweeter type of breakfasts. Totally, and you know what? That that breakfast that you described with the cereal and the toast, I mean, A, it's something that my patients still eat, and I see that a lot. When I, I ask five questions, when I, working in the NHS, we have very short consultation times. I've gotta be very efficient with how I get a dietary recall, and a 24-hour diet recall of what they have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, what do they snack on, what do they drink, those five questions, gives me a really good perspective, snapshot perspective of how they're probably eating on a weekly basis. And the number of times cereal and toast comes up as a, as a morning routine with juice uh, or something else healthy, you know, healthy in, in, in quotes, in, people can't see on the hips, but yeah, in quotes, um, is it, staggering. Um, and I used to be one of those people when I was working as a junior doctor because of time pressures, because I was taught by commercials, that a healthy breakfast is something with added fiber or something, you know, Cheerios because it's whole grain. Um, I sort of bought into that because we weren't taught nutrition at medical school. And it wasn't until I actually looked at the research and looked at actually what the sugar component is, the lack of fiber or the type of fiber that they add to cereals to give the claim that it's added fiber. It's pretty shocking actually. I don't think a lot of people realize that because um, there's health bars now, there's, um, uh, snack bars with added uh, fiber in, they make the claim that it's got 10 grams of fiber or 15 grams of fiber. The particular type of fiber isn't a complete fiber. You only find complete fibers in things like fruits or plant fibers in their whole, f- in their whole form or, uh, or even whole grains. The types of fibers that are added to um, uh, fast moving consumer goods, um, so the health snack bars and that kind of stuff, is a, is a specific type of uh, singular fiber um, that doesn't have the same benefits as if eating the whole food. And, and often so, sourced because it's just cheap. Exactly, it, because it's cheap, exactly. So it doesn't have that sort of um, uh, the glycemic blunting effect, the sugar blunting effect. It doesn't have that that you do have, in even things like fruits as well. And I think there's a lot of fear mongering around fruits um, because of people going on high fat diets and stuff. And I think there's definitely therapeutic potential for low carb diets, high fat diets, et cetera, particularly for brain health. 
But for a lot of people, fruit is actually something that's very, very good for us, particularly the low glycemic fruits. Um, so the berries, the, uh, the wild sort of things that you, you find um, that have a, a, a sort of like a more acidic taste to them as well. Um, but they're, they're very good, particularly from the perspective of our gut as well. Especially if you eat them in whole form, you know, a trend that's very popular now in the US. And actually, I was just in the UK. We were hanging out a, a week ago. And uh, I see it there too, is there's uh, a lot of healthy places that are out there that have like acai bowls, mm. which are fun every so often. But the yeah. challenge is now you have a, a fruit and often it has d bananas and dates and yeah. other stuff yeah. that yeah. are all kind of blended into it. So even sometimes those things that we think of as being healthy, if we're not eating the fruit in the whole form, if that is the primary diet that we have, that also can have some challenges too of spiking blood sugar, that sort of stuff. So you're saying that fruit in its whole form with the fiber that's there, especially things like berries, which is one of your brain foods, yeah. uh, is a great thing to include into your diet. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in terms of like uh, putting food on a pedestal, I think all food deserves that sort of attention. But particularly like, you know, berries, um, the wild types of berries, the low, the low sugar sort of berries, um, greens, whole grains as well. So things actually with the fiber husks on them. So things like rice, I think is great. Water, super important. The number of people that I speak to who don't drink water consistently through the day, staggering. And if you think about like the, the, the association with headaches or the association with mental fatigue, and you know, if you're not drinking enough water and you don't realize that, you're not aware or conscious of that, at 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. when you have that natural lull, you're going to reach for the energy drink or you're going to reach for a coffee and that's going to set you in a vicious cycle of increasing the amount of caffeine that you have in your diet. That's going to impact your sleep. It's going to impact how you feel the next day. It's going to make you more sugar hungry. We know that you're going to have increased hunger levels if you have shorter uh, spans of sleep, particularly when you have detriments to uh, REM sleep and deep sleep. Um, and that's going to set you on this cascade as well. And something that I was part of, you know, I was having the cereal and I was, you know, reliant on sort of different ways in which to improve my energy. I wasn't drinking enough, all these different things. So, yeah. A big part of your book is uh, the lifestyle component. Yeah. In fact, the book could be called uh, uh, Live to Beat Dis Illness. Yeah. Right? yeah. Live to build Ill Beat Illness. And you talk about um, in each chapter, with the different food recommendations, you also talk about lifestyle 360, other yeah. lifestyle factors. I'd love to just touch on one. We've done a whole bunch of podcasts on it, but I think it's re uh, relevant. Uh, you're traveling right now. We yeah. had just a little chit chat before the podcast. We were both talking about how um, we didn't get the best sleep last night. Yeah. <laughs> because for me, it's a little tough to sleep sometimes in hotels, it's super stuffy. Um, there's often like off gassing from like the, you know, the different furniture that's out there. And then the AC, we're in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> the AC often creates an environment where like you get really stuffy at night. So what are your, what do you want people to know about sleep? And then how do you particularly, what are things that you've done uh, over the course of doing research for this book and just living your life that you've found you that for you tremendously help with sleep? Definitely. So when, as we're talking about traveling, pre-work uh, for your travel is super important. So if the last couple of, the last week, I've been trying to trying to figure out how I improve my sleep uh, whilst I'm over here. So I'm actually trying to go to sleep a little bit earlier during the week because I know that I'm going to be in a sleep deficit for the next week or so. Also, when I jumped on the flight, I had a morning flight and it was coming over this way, so going west. So I made sure that first part of the flight, I was sleeping. Sleep mask on, earphones in blanket wrapped around me, slept for the first couple of hours, and then I woke up because then I'd be on time for when I arrived in Texas. Just trying to time for jet lag and that sort of thing. Time for jet lag, exactly. And then I took a few tips from yourself as well. So I looked at uh, magnesium, so magnesium citrate. Um, magnesium citrate is a little bit more bioavailable than the other forms of magnesium that you can buy, so I always look for that. Um, uh, a little bit of melatonin, which we can't get in the UK, but I, I do use that. I used to use that for shift work as well uh, in the evenings um, and plenty of hydration. I also uh, try not to drink any alcohol because I know that's going to further detriment my sleep. Um, I actually wear something called an aura ring mm -hmm. and it actually measures my sleep in the evenings. I find that really useful uh, just to measure like the quality of my sleep and, and uh, nudging myself actually into better sleep habits. Um, so that's travel. 
with with sleep, um, there's a couple of things that I've started to do a lot more, and that's actually eat a lot earlier in the in the evenings rather than later, because I know again through tracking with my aura ring and how I feel in the morning that that um, that really does uh, have an impact on the quality of my sleep. So the speed at which I'd go into deep sleep earlier on. Um, will be impacted if I eat later on in the evening. And if that has an impact on my deep sleep, it might have a knock-on effect on my REM sleep, and it means that I might be waking up in the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. So that's one thing, eating early in the day. Um, hydration status, uh, I don't want to get up in the evening to go to the toilet, which is a, a common problem for people. And when they get up, they can't go back to sleep. So I try and actually limit my drinking over the last uh, four to three, three to four hours before going to bed. Um, so actually, I try and get my hydration so it's throughout the day when I'm going to be on my feet. And I try not to drink as much. So I'm trying to hit that two liters of water way, but way earlier so it doesn't wake me up. Because sometimes people find themselves, especially right before bed, their mouth is parched, yeah. they're, they're dry, but that's often related to hydration earlier in the day. Exactly. And yeah. if you have that later on, there's also some concerns. I know there's been some presentations here at the Functional Medicine Conference in the years in the past that we, we really don't want a lot in our body, food or water, sitting there while we're lying flat. Yeah. Yeah. Because that can increase our risk for uh, small intestinal bacterial growth. If that water, if that food is not having a chance to sort of naturally move through our digestive system as it would throughout the day. So eating even too late, drinking too late, you're just laying flat and then the food and the weight and the water is just stagnant. It's exactly. not a good thing. There's so many other processes that you want uh, to go on uh, whilst you're sleeping. And one of the things is the exposure to melatonin as well. And we know that if you're eating later on, the um, melatonin levels are going to be impacted. That's going to affect the level of your sleep. And melatonin is sort of seen as like a, you know, the sleepy hormone or whatever. But actually, it, it plays a vital role in antioxidant capacity. It has a vital role in anti-cancer activity as well. So we want an immune function. So we want to make sure that we're getting that good dose of melatonin exposure during our sleeping uh, time. So. If we're gonna have anything to, to try and reduce the impact, it's gonna be eating uh, earlier in the day and also light exposure. Um, so trying to minimize exposure to bright lights, particularly from phones and, and computer screens and that kind of stuff, because I know that definitely has an impact on melatonin secretion. In addition to that, ruminations, stress, I mean, we're here at the, the Functional Medicine Conference on, on pain, addiction, and stress. Um, Performing a gratitude exercise in the evenings has really helped me dial down the sort of um, personal reflections, the ruminations of like how the day went or things I've got to do in the morning or that kind of stuff that will keep me awake or keep my brain way too active before going to bed. So actually doing a gratitude journal that I did uh, on social media for like 700 plus days um, and I still do now but I do it privately. Um, is a really good way of winding down and actually reducing the ruminations that you have whilst you're sleeping so it doesn't impact your sleep. Um, that's probably one of the most effective things that I've done and I've measured that as well, again, using my tracking devices to, to see the impact and the quality of the sleep. One of the beautiful things about gratitude is I was, I was thinking about gratitude uh, last year and uh, I was like, you know what? Gratitude is really creating contrast. It's, yeah. it's hard for us to stress sometimes has to be put in perspective. It's yeah. hard for us to sort of realize that something really doesn't matter as much as we think, unless we see some contrasts. That's why sometimes people go to other countries or impoverished areas and they see that, wow, there's people that have it a lot worse than me. Let me be a little bit more thankful than, I, than me, than, than, uh, than I am for my life right now. How can I help them? How can I be a part of it? That's the contrast there and gratitude is that contrast. I love what you did with, uh, remember exactly what you called it, but it was like the three things I'm grateful for every yeah. night yeah, yeah. you did on Instagram stories yeah, yeah. for like 700 days. Yeah, yeah. It was really great. Yeah. A lot of people, it just started out as like something I was going to do for 15 days and then just people would sort of encouraged and people started their own. I had a follower who was on like 100 plus days or something. And the, the stories of how that impacted people's cognition, their sleep, as well as their general well-being was great. And I, I highly encourage people to do it. And I might do one every now and then actually just to sort of re-emphasize um, re the point about gratitude. And I love this concept of like, um, you know, uh, contrast and, and actually having balance and appreciating the good things uh, in contrast to the bad things. You kind of need both. And I see a parallel with that in the human body. Like the process of homeostasis isn't 
all removing all inflammation, for example, because we do need inflammation in small amounts to signal to our body about uh, stresses or to fight pathogenic bacterial microbes or to signal to different molecules about how we need to grow. Um, or, you know, boosting immunity, for example. It's not all about ramping up our immunity. It's about balancing our immunity because we need our immune system to, yes, recognize mutagenic uh, cells, to clear them away, um, but we also need like a balanced immunity because otherwise we lead to things like autoimmune disease and we don't have a, a regulated immune system um, that becomes overactive and it actually leads to damage to the body. So I, I love the parallels, it's like all about contrast and this, this concept of dynamic um, uh, movement and homeostasis and actually the yin and yang. I mean, these are sort of parallels with ancient medicine that we've known for years. It's sort of something that I've come to realize is, is paramount to the, the, the true functioning of the human body. Even at this conference where they're talking about stress and addiction, especially when it comes to stress, what are the good stresses? What are the stresses that we can take on yeah. and embrace in our life and actually push our body to sort of give our body that nudge that it wouldn't normally seek out on its own. And there's a lot of research on that. And that actually leads into the next area, exercise as being one of those categories. So how help us understand how exercise can be part of that good stress that can help our body and our mitochondria renew and many other benefits uh, for the brain. Absolutely. So exercise is something I use quite a bit as an analogy as to why inflammation might be a good thing in small amounts or it's a it's an adaptive response. So when we exercise in the short term it's a pro-inflammatory uh, outcome. So we're increasing shear factors to our muscles, we're increasing circulating levels of inflammatory markers. We are putting our, our body under stress essentially. But overall, that leads to an, an adaptive response and it leads to uh, a resilience that leads to overall benefits to the human body. So when you exercise, you're increasing mitochondrial biogenesis, you're increasing infl circulating inflammation, you're causing shearing to your muscles. And by the process of repair, it leads to things like hypertrophy. It leads to things like removal of uh, malfunctioning cells. It leads to a better cardiovascular system at a macro level. There are so many benefits of exercise that in the short term, if you looked at it over the first like 30 minutes after exercise, you'd be like, this is a really bad thing. We shouldn't be doing this. If you look over the long term, it's like, oh, actually, no, this actually leads to resilience, it leads to benefits. It's a, a, like, um, it's something like uh, uh, the hormetic effect of, of plant chemicals. So turmeric, everyone thinks of turmeric as like an anti-inflammatory herb, right? It's, a, it's on all the supermarkets, everyone's talking about turmeric being anti-inflammatory. When you look at it, it's a, it's a plant hormetic compound. So Can you just explain hormesis for those that are listening? To yeah, the yeah. So hormesis is essentially the uh, dose response of a particular plant compound leading to uh, inflammation in the short term, but overall benefit over the long term. So it actually leads to an adaptive response. So in the case of turmeric, when you introduce it, it elicits a pro-inflammatory uh, reaction. But overall, that encourages the body to reduce the inflammation overall. So overall, it has an anti-inflammatory benefit. So that's why we look at turmeric like it's an anti-inflammatory. Actually, it's a plant hormetic. Um, and some peppers up often operate in the same uh, capacity. Yeah, yeah. So pepperin, pepperine, it improves the uh, bioavailability of turmeric, and and actually. Turmeric isn't on its own. Resveratrol has been argued as a plant hormetic compound. Um, a lot of the different sort of polyphenols that we have in our diet, they're plant hormetic compounds, because when we're in, uh, ingesting them, what they are, the, these different polyphenols, they're essentially the um, stress compounds that plants release to protect themselves against microbes, against defenses and that kind of stuff, which is why organic produce May, be, uh, may have greater amounts of phytochemicals and greater amounts of um, micronutrients because they are under a lot more stress. So they don't have the, uh, the benefits of having um, a weed killer uh, to, to- Or produce. DNA that's modified that way. Or DNA that's modified, exactly. So when you're introducing these compounds into your body, they're eliciting a mild stress-like effect but that leads to overall benefits to the body, which is the same sort of analogy I like to, to use with exercise as well. So it's quite interesting when you, when you look into the subject a lot, in a lot more detail, which is something I've been doing during my master's. I'm still studying. I wouldn't regard myself as an expert in any way. And I don't think even after studying this for 14 years, which I imagined to do, I would ever be an expert because there's just so much to learn. And my understanding of how things are in the human body has evolved so much over the last year, let alone the last 10 years. 
Um, but I find these parallels with ancient medicine and modern medicine and, and nutritional science absolutely fascinating because we just learn so much. And it just, it always comes down to the same principles. Eat fiber, largely plants, quality fats, eating in time, and eating whole, i.e. reducing the amount of refined sugars. And when you apply those concepts to any meal, any cuisine, you can make anything healthy. And that's the same thing. It's kind of like, um, uh, have you heard of um, Samin Nusra? She, she wrote the book, uh, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Yeah. Um, it's a Netflix program. Uh, I love the way she uses those, this four elements of food to describe how you can make any meal delicious. If you get the right level of salt, fat, acid, heat, you can make any dish delicious. I like to think if you get the right level of whole food, uh, quality fats, fiber, um, plant focused uh, and eating in time, you can make any meal healthy. Uh, and it's sort of that recipe for, for looking after your brain, but also your heart and, and everything else. So we veered off of exercise. <laughs> no, not at all. It's perfect. When your uh, book came out and, you know, talking about these uh, elements of ancient nutrition, uh, the latest science, you know, all these examples. Did your mom text you afterwards and just say, like, <laughs> I told you so? <laughs> She's constantly telling me, I told, told, I told you, so. you so. Yeah, tons. And like, I was giving a conference to um, uh, some health practitioners, some functional medicine practitioners, and uh, some nutritional therapists. And they were all arguing, you know, but your, com your conventional medical community doesn't appreciate or doesn't accept Ayurveda, or it doesn't accept Chinese medicine. I'm like, look, you can call it whatever you want. Call it lifestyle medicine, call it functional medicine, call it nutrition. It doesn't matter. As long as the patient is getting the right information, as long as the patient is being encouraged to live a way that's conducive to a healthy body and a healthy mind, that's all that matters. The infighting between, you know, Ayurvedic medicine practitioners and naturopaths and all the rest of it, I think it kind of detracts from actually the main goal, which is helping our patients live healthy, happy lives using food and lifestyle medicine. So yeah, when my mom says, I told you so, I just, I, I love that. I think it's great because she does. She, yeah, and she the whole reason you. why I got into this is because of her, so. Yeah, especially uh, cooking. She taught you how to cook. Yeah. And we talked about that in the first podcast. Yeah, before That's I went to medical school, yeah. <laughs> um, speaking about reactions to the book, uh, any stories of fellow doctors or practitioners that are at the hospital um, I guess you call it s surgery. Yeah, yeah. That have uh, picked up your book and and uh, had insights or, or transformations or stories. Anything that you can share with us? Yeah, uh, feedback yeah. That you've gotten? I've had some pretty amazing feedback from a ton of people, a ton of followers, a ton of uh, nurses in particular that have picked up the book and given it to their partners and stuff. And it's just, it's encouraged people to look at food in a completely different way. <clears throat> I think the, the gravitas of having a doctor talking about uh, food and nutrition is, is super important. Ironically, given that we don't get taught nutrition uh, and the fact that people are taking more attention to it, it's, it's quite funny. But, you know, I like to, to, to give people the understanding that I, I'm giving an educated, unbiased view of nutrition medicine. And I think by having a doctor talk about it and encouraging people using delicious, uh, culturally diverse meals to look after your health, it's a very attractive proposition. So the people that I've heard of have like improved things like psoriasis, improved brain fog and mental clarity. People have improved yes weight, but also just how they're feeling in themselves or improving the way people look at food and actually uh, get more ingredients in the diet. The simple concepts of variety, fiber, color, all these different things. I just love seeing that. And I, I hope to continue on this mission, man, because I know that can help a lot of people. I've seen it anecdotally in my own clinic, but we also see it spread out across all the different research studies that I've used going into this book. And that's why, you know, I can talk about skin health, immune health, and inflammation health, and, and talk about it into great depth, but still bringing people out of that and actually looking, you know what, it's all the same, guys. It's just getting those healthy principles, and lifestyle principles to look after every aspect of our well-being. They say that one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it. And I'm sure in writing this book, there was research that you were there. We're like, okay, I kind of knew about that, but like, yeah. whoa, is there one section uh, or area or, or disorder or condition that you were writing about and it just like blew your mind? Yeah. What yeah. was available to it? Can you uh, Absolutely. pick one and share a little bit more about it? Yeah, definitely. It was a um, mitochondrial signaling actually uh, in the immune section. So in the immune health section, I, I talk about um, A, what the function of our immune system is for. It's there, yes, to protect us against pathogenic material, uh, um, uh, bacteria and microbes and our skin as part of our immune system, etc. 
but it's also there to be the internal sort of um, monitoring system, our, our internal, everyone likes to think of our immune system as our aggressive military force, you know, fighting off uh, uh, infection, defending us against ill health. But actually, it's also uh, got a peacekeeper role in our, in our body. So it's, it's going around, it's looking for um, uh, mutant cells, it's clearing away them. It's actually recognizing friend from foe. That's why a lot of our immune system, around 70% of our lymph cells and uh, immune cells are located around the gut. Um, and it's performing very much a peacekeeper role as well. As, and one of the most important things to, to think about is the impact of mitochondrial function supporting our mitochondria. Um, through things, removing westernized foods, removing inflammatory foods, and improving things like uh, in, intracellular antioxidants and improving plant fibers and all the rest of that, um, as having a signaling role involved in immune health as well. And to, to cut a, a short, but long-winded biology story short, improving mitochondrial support is essential for improving our immune function. And I like to say improving immune function rather than boosting immunity, because I think it's... Uh, it's, it's more true to the, the actual function of our immune system to say we're supporting our immune system rather than boosting it. Because if we just let it do what it needs to do, it often operates just really well. Yeah. So, so in a lot of the chapters, you talk about foods that, that will support it and improve the function or allow it to happen naturally. But then naturally, there's the contrast of things that, that can kind of take away from it or damage it. What are some of the most common things that affect how our immune system operates and can have an, have an impact on that. Absolutely. So one, one of the things that we're taught in functional medicine, start with the gut, right? So the gut is probably essential to every single chapter in the book. I could have talked about the gut in every single chapter. And in fact, fiber comes up as one of the recommendations for food that we should be having all the time and different types of fiber as well. So when you look, about, uh, look at the, the gut functioning, specifically the lens of immunity, you realize A, it's got a huge role in terms of, of um, recognizing friend from foe. Um, when we introduce different sorts of plant fibers, what are they doing? Well, they're giving fermentable fibers to our microbes. And what do they do? They create things like short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, the top three are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And they're used to nourish the colonocytes, so the different sorts of cells that you find in your colon. They're also there to provide energy to them. They're also there to provide an anti-inflammatory role. They have a, a role in signaling uh, as well. Um, they have a vital role in immune function. There's two kind of schools of thinking. One, one school of thinking is like, okay, well, we need to give exogenous sort of short-chain fatty acids in them different ways. And whilst, yes, there are therapeutic benefits of doing that in isolated cases, the mainstay of treatment is just trying to get as many different types of fibers. And that's why a rainbow diet, eating the colors, having lots of different types of plant fibers, is absolutely essential to supporting our immune system. And that's why I think I talk about that in, in every section. Here in America, I don't know if it's the same case in the UK, but we've seen a, a, an uptick in colon cancers. Yeah. And one of the theories, of course, there's a lot of things that play into to that uh, increased alcohol consumption, all, all sorts of different components that could play into it. But one of the theories is this, the, the reduction in diversity and the reliance on more processed foods or pre-prepared foods. Last year in the US was the first year that people spent more on eating out than they did on groceries yeah. as a total. And so now we're relying on finished foods from places, prepackaged items. We're not getting that same level of diversity um, often inside of our diet, and that has all sorts of implications. Absolutely. We just, there's a paper that came out, I think, just last week about ultra-processed foods and how that encourages people to A, overeat because they don't have the same satiety signals. So the, um, uh, the, the, the production of leptin, which actually uh, reduces the satiety signals, uh, sorry, reduces the amount that we feel hungry, um, is not affected to the same degree as normal whole foods. So that leads to overeating. We're also with ultra processed foods, obviously we're removing a lot of the fiber because it's already pre-digested or there's a lot of fiber removed. So that again reduces the roughage that we have to push through um, uh, different sorts of materials in the colon. We know that if you are constipated, you have a greater <coughs> likelihood, sorry, <coughs> 
when you have uh, less fiber, you have a greater exposure to envir environmental pollutants that are naturally removed from the colon when you push, uh, push them out. Um, and the exposure to environmental pollutants will lead to more reabsorption of them as well through the system. And that's why you have uh, um, potentially a greater propensity to, to colon cancers and different sorts of cancers. Um, but it's the same issue that we're seeing in the UK as well. You know, we have rising rates of, of colon cancer. We have uh, way too much uh, convenience food in our, in our um, food industry, in our, in our food sort of market. Um, and people just aren't eating enough whole foods as well and evaluating the amount of fibers that we have. There's also the, the, the school of thinking around um, immune health as well. So we know that um, certain types of um, fillers um, and additives to food will increase the translocation of pathogenic bacteria through um, parts of the colon called M cells. So M cells are responsible for um, uh, looking at sort of friend from foe. Uh, and we know, and there is a clear uh, association, potentially causative association with fillers like polysorbate 80 um, and other food additives that may be increasing the amount of uh, pathogenic material that gets in through the gut wall and it causes that inflammatory reaction, includes that Im immune uh, reaction that leads to uh, um, poor, um, uh, leads to uh, damage to the, the colon, which leads to colitis. And examples of foods that could contain those fillers? Uh, I would say convenience foods, where you have a ton of ingredients in the back, you would just look through them. Um, things that I find, uh, you, you'll find probably in um, uh, takeaways, um, deep fried fatty foods. I don't want to name any convenience stores here, but you, you probably know the big ones uh, that are globally everywhere. Um, there is a rising rate of IBDs, inflammatory bowel disease, that includes ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. Um, whether that's related to uh, increased processed meats, whether it's increased uh, additives to food, it's quite hard to say, but there's definitely a correlation there. And I think the more whole foods you have in the diet, the better that's going to be for colitis. And we know actually that increasing fibers, particularly from fruit actually, um, can reduce the flares of uh, colitis that you see. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's tons of research done. And I think it all comes back to the same thing. Eat more whole foods and eat more fiber. Which I think is important also for people who think that they eat very healthy is because it's, if you still rely on a lot of packaged healthy foods, yeah and not whole foods, there's still, as the health movement grows and continues to become massive, multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry worldwide and more companies are being bought and more of the big players like Pepsi and Nestle and other things are getting into their own quote unquote healthy foods, there are still a lot of these additives or other components that still have a detrimental impact on our health. Absolutely. I know for me, the one thing that I got super clear on, I was, all, you know, for the last 12 years, um, I, I went on a gluten-free diet almost 20 years ago in the year 2000. Wow. <laughs> I went on a gluten-free and I, I, I removed dairy and gluten out of my diet and I didn't even know what gluten was at the time. I did it primarily because I was at a talk uh, with the lady who was talking more about from an animal rights perspective, but she shared a study showing how dairy for some people, especially uh, uh, Black, African American people, South Asian, and Asian populations, a lot of people are naturally act lactose intolerant. But even if you're not lactose intolerant, uh, a lot of commercial dairy is very, can be pro inflammatory. Yeah. So if you have skin issues, which I did at the time, I had really bad acne in high school, and I had tried a lot of different things, and I went on different gel, Accutane, all the different yeah, stuff that's yeah, out there, wow. and uh, nothing really worked. And I got off of dairy, processed sugar, and then later on gluten. And especially because of the dairy, my skin cleared up within a matter of months. Yeah. And I saw a completely, and people would ask me like, what did you do? And yeah, what, did, yeah. what happened? I'm like, why did I not know about this in high school? Yeah. <laughs> when I had my first girl, you know, girlfriend and I was taking my prom photos. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to see those prom photos. I know. I, know, I got to find the photos. Yeah. Uh, well, I got kicked out of my prom. That's a different story. <laughs> so I don't even think I got photos. <laughs> That's great. But... Uh, so one thing I found out for myself, so I've been, in the, I've been playing with my diet for a while. I've been having uh, attention on my diet. But one thing that I really noticed in the last uh, five years is that I would still rely on some of these healthy packaged foods that would have things like canola oil inside of there. And I realized that when I cut out canola oil, and especially for me, fried, fried foods, even if they're like healthy sweet potato fries, yeah. I stopped getting sick. Yeah. Now that's for me. Yeah. My sort of Achilles heel was always my tonsils and my throat and that sort of thing. And I can always tell when I travel 
and I eat these foods, even if they're healthy packaged yeah. foods, healthy quote unquote, those all have an impact on my immune system and I just feel tired, more lethargic. And it really does come back to this idea of really getting back to whole foods. Totally, man. It's so funny you say that, right? So I was uh, asked to be a judge for um, some healthy food awards, healthy quote unquote, uh, for a big magazine uh, in the UK, it's a big health magazine. Um, and we were taken into uh, their offices and they laid out all the different foods. We had different categories, alternative milks, energy bars, uh, snacks, like nut butter, all this stuff, right? So we had um, ton, like probably 10 different types of foods in every category. Bar the nut butter category, which is pretty much 100% nuts, just ground, um, but some of them still had added like palm oil and, and you know, all, loads of other crap, salt and, and sugar. Um, uh, and maybe uh, another sort of category, I think it was uh, alternative milks, because some of those were fortified um, with things like iodine, which is an important source that we lack from a lot of different food components in our, in our normal diet. Man, everything was crap. Everything was crap. It had additives in, it had fillers in, it had sugar by different names. Um, it had uh, the amounts of sugars with different sort of natural sugars, quote unquote. You know, it has the same impact on lipoge de novo lipogenesis in the liver, so which is the process by which the liver creates its own sort of triglycerides and pumps them out to the, the rest of the body. Um, it, it, it was pretty staggering actually, because I, I don't personally eat these products, but I know a lot of people who are trying to be health conscious, just like you were, um, will be eating those, feeling safe in the knowledge that they're doing the right thing. Or it's being sold at Whole Foods or these other places. Whole Foods and you know, even John Mackey himself, before he retired uh, as CEO of Whole Foods, said, we sell a whole bunch of junk. And he was right. You know, he, his, his legacy, unfortunately, will be, you know, yes, Whole Foods has given people the option, but unfortunately, you still have to be pretty educated to navigate the food aisles of probably, arguably, the, the healthiest supermarket in the US and the UK now as well. Um, so yeah, that there's, there's tons of that. And to go about dairy, this is something I, I talk about in the, in the skin section. There are, there's two ways of looking at it, right? So I have tons of anecdotes from patients who have removed gluten and dairy and improved the acne. And the same thing, I have people who have removed everything from the diet and not had any impact whatsoever. There's a whole bunch of other things going on. But looking at the evidence base, right, what can we say, particularly looking at the perspective of acne, what can we say about um, elimination diets and acne? Well, first of all, I, I like to think about the body as to what we can put into the body to try and improve its function. You look at the skin function, for example, it's incredible. It, in the matrices, the fact that it has an immune function, the fact that we have photoprotectants in food, so things like um, uh, the, the different sorts of vitamin A, uh, the zeaxanthin, lutein, all these different things, they actually have the ability to physically reflect light. In addition to sun creams, we should be looking at diet, right? When we look at the function, uh, when we look at the dysfunction we see with acne, what we do know from the literature is that high refined uh, sugars, so high glycemic diets, may be impacting acne. Potentially, the mechanism by which is uh, through insulinotropic effects. So we increase insulin, that dis, uh, causes hormone dis uh, dysregulation and leads to acne. Worse in females than to men. You might have uh, had the same issue with that as well. So removing that, the, the high refined sugars, uh, high refined carbohydrates in your diet may have had impacts on that. So milk may be acting by the same mechanism. So when you introduce milk, particularly from skim milk, when you introduce milk into the diet, it has the insulinotropic effect pro-inflammatory potentially as well. And it might be impacting hormonal dysregulation, which causes acne in a lot of cases. So that's why we see a large proportion of people um, having benefits of removing dairy. There lies the question, okay, if you're removing dairy, what are the potential nutritional complications of that? The big thing, and a lot of people think about calcium, right? Calcium milk and whatever. You get calcium from a whole bunch of different sources. Sesame seeds is a great source. Tofu is a great source from green quality. Green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, beans, fantastic. Iodine is a very important source. And uh, with, there are not a, a many sources of iodine in the diet. So when you're removing things like dairy, which is the commonest source, one of the commonest sources of iodine in the diet. Because they're being fortified? Uh, no, no, because no. It, it naturally occurring naturally iodine. Has iodine, yeah, naturally iodine. So you're going to be thinking, okay, where am I going to get my iodine from? Um, and fish, uh, quality, quality uh, fish, 
great source of iodine. If you're vegan, you may want to supplement with iodine. But beyond that, you know, fortified milks are actually pretty good. There's some really good alternative milks that have fortification with iodine in it. And it's a very important thing, particularly for childbearing women, because it impacts thyroid function, but it also impacts the, the, uh, the health of the baby in utero as well. And we're seeing some negative effects uh, with people cutting out dairy actually and not having enough iodine and having some uh, pregnancy complications. So um, yeah, I think it definitely has benefits uh, for certain people. We need to like sort of balance the nutritional, potential nutritional complications of, of removing certain foods. I think there's definitely a healthy way to do all these things. Um, yeah. And I welcome more research into it because, you know, as your experience is, it has benefits, man. You know, I, I actually don't have that much dairy in my diet and my, um, uh, not my skin, but certainly my, my nasal passages, ENT issues that I used to have. I had my tonsils out as a kid. I used to have recurrent tonsillitis. All that kind of stuff has improved as well. It might be my, my general immune function though as well. It might be my, my gut bacteria. It might be a whole bunch of other things. So there's so much to learn in the subject. It's exciting. You were saying earlier that a big part of uh, your deep dive into this world and, and sort of the, the parody of it is that, you know, you're a doctor that's writing these books and talking about nutrition and now you're going back for your nutrition masters but you didn't get a lot of education in school about it. And uh, a lot of people look to their doctors, both in the US and the UK and globally to like, what do I eat? How do I feel better? Or how do I improve this condition? And food, as we've learned through your book, has such a central role in improving those things. Uh, that's a big part of why you've gotten into the work of culinary nutrition. Mm. Tell us about that and like, what are the goals with it? What is your hope for you know, the Rupi, Dr. Rupi who was young <laughs> in med school and, and what you would want that uh, young physician to be learning about. Yeah, so uh, culinary medicine is actually a concept that you guys over here started like over 10 years ago. Harvard School has got their own culinary medicine program. Tulane Medical School has got their own, probably the most I think successful Tufts one. has one as well. Tufts have got, yeah. There's a whole bunch out there, man. And, you know, there's people who, like amazing researchers, who've been talking about food as medicine for a long time, and it just hasn't translated into medical education. Um, in the UK by a long shot. So over the last couple of years, I've put together a team of dietitians, doctors, like-minded people who want to see improvements in the nutrition curricula, which is non-existent in the UK. And we got together and uh, we worked for a bit with Tulane on their course and stuff. Uh, and now we're creating bespoke programs for different universities in the UK. So we, we worked with Bristol University last year. Jamie Oliver came down. Uh, we did a four-week intensive program where we taught these uh, medical students, not only the foundations of nutrition, but also how to cook in a, in a culinary environment with a professional chef alongside a, a professional dietitian as well. So they're getting all angles, like my sort of perspective of being a frontline doctor, the dietitian's perspective of the nutritional research, and the culinary perspective of a, of a chef as well. Um, and we've rolled that out now to Bristol again for the second year, but then this year for the first time, UCL, which is one of the best universities for medicine in Europe, um, if not globally, um, is going to be teaching an entire year group, so an entire 350 student year group culinary medicine. They're going to get a day in the kitchen with a chef, and they're going to be taught how to translate this nutritional science information into the context of a clinical consult, whether they become a surgeon, orthopedics, psychiatrist or general practitioner, everyone needs to be able to have a conversation about food. Um, and I'm super excited about that, man, because it's a nonprofit um, and the future is really a, a core nutritional program in every medical school in the country. And hopefully we can serve as a, a sort of uh, ideal as to how the medical curriculum should look like, because if you don't have food in the equation, we won't be able to fix our lifestyle related issues. We need a lifestyle related solution. And Even the doctors themselves often don't have the best diet, access to the best foods, and hospitals sometimes are complicit in it. Absolutely, man. And yeah. you know, the, I, I've been doing some own work in my uh, A and E department with my um, uh, nurses and doctors and stuff, and analyzing what they're eating. And unfortunately, it's just it's worse than the general population. You know, we work shifts, we have poor sleep, we lead to salt and sugar cravings. You know, that leads to the snack foods and all this kind of stuff. We're not the pillars of health that we should be. And um, I'm excited about getting this information out there and, and being the leader in, in this food and medicine conversation. I think there's been a, a lot of sort of um, uh, fearfulness around the concept in the UK for fear of you know being labeled a bit out there or whatever. But 
you know, I'm passionate about this subject. I've been talking about it openly for like the last four years and thinking about it for the last 10. Um, and now is really the time to, to, to make some changes in the medical curriculum. And I'm excited to see what that looks like in the next couple of years. And it's amazing that a lot of this is just really an awareness component. Yeah. Uh, when I went to my dermatologist when I was younger in high school, and I asked them, does food have any impact? Because people are telling me, you know, it's my grandmother who's telling me, or this grand aunt or somebody else that is practicing these ancient principles of Ayurveda or saying this or that. They said, there's no research that's out there. And as I then started making these shifts, I saw, okay, maybe there's not conclusive, big, double-blind trials, but there is emerging research. And sometimes the cost-benefit of trying emerging research uh, and that was back then. Since that time period, there's been so much that's come out here. In fact, my dear friend Anahat O'Connor, who writes for the New York Times, wrote a whole article on the link of the studies of sugar and acne mm -hmm. and uh, what we know right now about, um, about acne that's out there. So some, a, a big part of it is also just making uh, everybody, the general public, physicians, practitioners of all sorts and backgrounds, more of, aware of what is there because often when you get the immediate response of there's no evidence that's i don't know of anything yeah but yeah. when's the last time you went to a nutrition course exactly. when's the last time you studied yeah when's the last time that you flew out to a conference and learned the latest that's out there i think the estimates that were presented here at the conference is that in general mo modern sort of medicine that's uh out there in the world can be anywhere from 10 to 17 years behind the latest science that's happening right yeah, now. Yeah. Just because the nature of how big it is and how big the infrastructure is. Uh, so for any, any tips of, um, sometimes people write in on the podcast that, wow, I've been trying this, I've been getting you know, uh, benefits, but now that I've incorporated all these healthy fats, my doctor's yeah. like worry, worried about saturated fats yeah. in my diet. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So when people get pushback from their uh, practitioners or just people who have questions, yeah. could be family members, uh, what's your suggestion to, to them? Yeah, so I think when people have questions about nutrition, it's going to be very hard to get any answers from your general physician unless they've actually gone through the rigmarole of going through those studies themselves or actually teaching themselves in nutrition. Um, and that's something we're trying to, we're trying to fix, right? The, the other aspect of it is that, yes, you're right, there aren't going to be you know, rigorous trials out there, but hey, we're never going to get those trials because A, funding is not there for them. They're incredibly expensive and time-consuming to do. And there isn't the incentive there either. So we have to rely on emerging research or basic first principles of uh, trying things that may have an impact and are likely going to have side effects. That, for me, is better than trying an experimental pharmaceutical or an experimental intervention that doesn't have long-term data. Uh, and we are witnessing a lot more uh, drugs come to the market and then being taken off the market five or 10 years later because of adverse side effects. You're not gonna see that with basic nutritional principles. So when you're saying about you know, quality fats, for example, if you're getting a lot of those fats from, from plants, whether it be nuts, seeds, uh, extra virgin olive oil, Yes, they all have saturated fat, but they guess what? They have tons of polyunsaturates, monounsaturates, anti-inflammatory benefits, omega-3, etc. When you're introducing a lot more uh, greens and different sort of plant materials, you're improving your gut. There's going to be, you know, there's so many different things that could potentially help with a whole bunch of different disorders, whether it be skin or cognitive or heart health. It, it is a disservice to the general public to not talk about nutrition in this day and age. And it kind of breaks my heart whenever I, when I hear those kind of stories. And that's actually why with culinary medicine, we take a case-focused approach. So we introduce the vignette of, you know, uh, Mrs. X, 18-year-old PCOS, uh, has uh, d d has triglyceride or imbalance in their cholesterol ratios, has a family history of cardiovascular disease, what do we give this person advice about with regards to lifestyle and nutrition? So we're making a lot more clean. But also, Drew Prohit, you know, comes in, 18-year-old, has acne. What can I tell this guy about his nutrition rather than just saying there isn't any evidence? I think that's like, a, you know, a huge disservice. And I think we need to change that sort of attitude. Uh, because it's a very important part of medicine as an adjunct to everything else that we have there in our repertoire. Where do you want to take this movement next, brother? You've uh, put some great books out there. You're constantly putting <laughs> out incredible uh, content on social media. 
And it's really a grassroots movement of just people seeking you out and speaking places. And, yeah. And uh, um, what, what, what's, what, do you, what do you want to take next? You know, how do, you, how do we make a, a dent? You know, sometimes the problem can seem so big. Yeah, yeah. It feels like, okay, is this making a difference? And like, what does the next version of it look like? Where, where would you like to take your work next? I think um, the books are great and the social media stuff is great, but it, the the trouble I'm having is how do I reach the vulnerable person in front of me in a supermarket whose shopping basket I'm looking at and it's just full of rubbish. And I'm like, that person is not gonna pick up my book. They are not engaged in anything that I'm talking about. And uh, bar me going up to them and giving them some gentle advice or like them coming into my clinic and then me giving them advice, I'm not gonna be able to scale this. And so what I'm trying to develop is a digital product that essentially helps people make the right choices when they're in a supermarket, when they're eating out, and making the decision fatigue associated with that go away. So essentially creating shopping baskets that people just uh, shop online or can use whenever they go out, and it just simplifies the whole process of eating well. Because as you know, as we've talked about, Quality fats, fiber, colors, all that kind of stuff is very simple for us. But for someone who's coming from that typical westernized diet, it's very difficult to make the connections between what they're eating and their potential uh, outcomes at the moment. So their, their potential medical issues or the future ones that are gonna be happening in the next 10 years. So my sort of idea is to create a, a super uh, easy, clean interface of a, a digital product that helps people live healthy, happy lives by helping them make the right choices with their food. It's beautiful. And anybody who's listening that wants to be a part of the process or maybe has ideas or suggestions, they can reach out to you? Yeah, thedoctorskitchen.com. And I'm on Doctor's Kitchen uh, on Instagram and social media. And uh, there's so many categories in the book that we didn't get a chance to get into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cancer. Yeah. Just, just name a few of them off, uh, yeah. off topic. So, so there's uh, either for brain, heart, cancer, skin, mood, uh, inflammation, immunity. Um, you know, the cancer one was probably the hardest uh, chapter to write because I don't want to give people the impression that cancer is one singular thing. It's an umbrella term for a whole multitude of different issues, uh, essentially characterized by cells that um, fall out of place and they cause a disordered growth. Um, and to suggest that you know there is one silver bullet for cancer is a misnomer and it doesn't exist. But actually, there is so much that we know about already to prove that food is a chemo preventative, so a substance that can prevent the likelihood of cancer occurring. Eating more plants, improving antioxidant capacity, micronutrients, all these different things have incredible ability to prevent cancer. And I think, I think as the National Institute of Health in, in this country came up with 35 different uh, foods um, that potentially have the, uh, the anti-cancer potential. So things like turmeric, garlic, red onion, brassica vegetables, all accessible ingredients that have the potential to reduce the burden of a disease that is affecting one in two people in the UK and probably more in the US. You know, we shouldn't be looking at these rising rates of cancer and it's multifactorial and there's a whole bunch of nuance to the subject. But I think, you know, if we don't talk about it, we're creating a vacuum that is willingly being filled by a lot of people who are spreading a lot of misconceptions about cancer. Or uh, product companies or, you know, marketing that just creating convenience, but not really educating people. I saw a study that uh, one of the doctors at our clinic at the Ultra Wellness Center in Massachusetts, uh, uh, Dr. Liz Bohm posted on Instagram, talking about how you know, women who have five drinks or more a week uh, increase their risk of breast cancer by, cancer by X percentage. And so you know, we have to get the word out on the good quality evidence-based information that's out there so that people can be empowered and make these uh, decisions and choices. Um, and you also have an online course all about food medicine yeah. that people can take. Can you just tell us about that? Yeah, where find yeah. That? It's a, so it's a four week course that I put together um, it's on my website and it just basically gives people the, the basic understanding of why food is medicine, how it impacts inflammation, how to chop an onion, how to prepare greens, uh, how to add sort of micronutrient dense sides to your meal, what kind of things to choose when you're eating out, just the basics over four weeks of uh, how to live the healthiest, li the healthiest life using food. 
Um, it's something that I'm constantly adding new content to and recording at the studio and stuff. So, you know, hopefully we can make a dent in these lifestyle related illnesses because it starts on our plates. Last topic, you know how passionate I am about community and friendship yeah. in other areas and a big part of it, so much of this weekend at the Functional Medicine Conference here in San Antonio is we can make an impact on stress, addiction, uh, even supportive uh, for people who are in chronic pain, how important community is for that. And we know that when we surround ourselves with amazing individuals, they, they inspire us to continue that lifestyle. They inspire us to eat healthy, and make food together. What are hacks that you have in your life back at home in the UK that you figure out a way to like incorporate friendship or community on a regular basis to support all the goals that you have in your life, including your health? Definitely. So I think social connectivity, um, community, sense of purpose, entirely uh, weaved in with our uh, well-being and our, and our health. And it's something that I touch on pretty much in every chapter, actually, in terms of how to cultivate that understanding of why it's a necessity to meet with people and actually to uh, be part of a tribe rather than just being on social media or having that sort of distance. Um, and one of the things that I do personally is I schedule uh, friendship meetings, I schedule dinners, I schedule, you know, every every time in my week I've got some downtime that I'm spending time with someone who I love and there's a reciprocal relationship there. Um, and I schedule time with my family as well. Like Sundays are pretty sacred. Uh, I try not to work on Sundays, although with all the different things I'm doing, it's quite hard to navigate that. But um, Sundays with family time is it's something very, very important. And that is a way of, of fueling your health. Uh, and I think, you know, we've heard so much stuff about uh, my studies and how that actually enhances empathy, enhances our immune uh, uh, function. Uh, it reduces the likelihood of chronic uh, lifestyle related disease. You know, these are all things that we can't sniff at. This isn't like, you know, on the fringes of conventional medicine. This is very much medicine. So, you know, the kind of content you put out about uh, community and friendship, it really just speaks to me. And there's a lot of evidence base coming behind that now. There is, there absolutely is. Rupi, thank you for being on the podcast. Super appreciate it. Eat to beat illness. It's out there. It's beautiful. You put a lot of hard work into this book. It looks gorgeous. The recipes are amazing. Um, and also you have the Doctor's Kitchen podcast. Yes. Which is out there. Check the show notes for the book. Check the show notes for the podcast and the online course. Uh, super appreciate you, man. Thank you for being an amazing friend and educating the world about uh, how food is medicine. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, Keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Glucose is uptaken by every single cell in the body, but because cancer cells are revved up, they are able to actually take that nutrient and actually fuel themselves. So what 